all the way through this long process, that the chance of screwing it up was very high. You know? and, um, and so there was a possibility that we would not pull it off. And I think that kind of terror drove us forward, really. Um, I mean, I knew when I saw the dailies, uh, when I saw hours and hours and hours of the dailies after they all came back to Toronto, I went to see Deepa there. I mean, at that point, I knew that we had the possibility of doing something good because the thing you can't ever change, you know, is how the film looks and how the actors act. Once, once that's done, that's done. And, and if it's not there at that point, you're not going to get it. But it was clear when, when we went through that long process of looking at the dailies that the film looked extraordinary. I think what Giles Nutkins did was quite exceptional. And that the performances, you know, that every actor sort of given it 200%, you know, given it all they got. And I couldn't see a single weak link in the performances, you know. I mean, that's not completely true because there were two places where we had to revoice people, uh, but very small parts. You know, there were one or two parts where the voice just didn't feel right, so we had to put a stronger voice on, you know, but I mean, they were literally, those were tiny characters, you know, in terms of the, the major characters. It was quite clear that everybody had done a fantastic job. So at that point, you think, well, you have the raw material. You know, you have, you have performances which are wonderful and you have a film which looks great. And then you have to do the, you know, the place where the film is really made, in the cutting room. And that took a year, took more than a year, mm. actually. And in fact, it was went on so long that even after we started screening the film, we, still, we were still recutting it. Mm. That, you know, the film that was shown at the Telluride Film Festival was about seven or eight minutes longer than the film that was shown at the London Film Festival a couple of months later, because we just found things we thought we could take out, you know, and, and tighten. Um, and Deepa certainly, one of the things I've learned about her is that she's a real perfectionist. And one of the things that was hardest of all to get right, just technically, was exactly how the the magic scenes looked. You know, when 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 these children materialize and dematerialize, exactly how that should look, because it clearly had to look unusual enough that the, that you could see that something kind of surreal was taking place. But at the same time, we wanted it to feel like real. We wanted it to feel like a group of real children arguing with, with each other in a room. Uh, so that just the, the technical aspect of that, is that I think we, we had to go back to the laboratory many times um, until we were happy with the way that that looked. So, so there were some things that were really very hard to get right. Um, and just, you know, the first rough cut that we did, after that looking at the daily session, the first rough cut was four and a half hours long. Um, and the finished film is less than two and a quarter. So we basically had to cut it in half. <laughs> and uh, and that, that was quite a ride. Talk about, uh, uh, as a voiceover person, I think the voiceover for this is perfect. This is, this is it, it adds to it. Talk about what that experience was like for you. Well, thank you. Well, one of the things that we both agreed, you know, initially we had, I mean, I'm not a great fan of there being a lot of voiceover in movies. You know, and I, I really prefer it when the film just tells its story. But we came to feel that given that, you know, this film is three generations and it's, it's so many characters and it's all, all over the place geographically, that it needed some organizing voice, you know, just to, just to hold it together. And the one thing we agreed, which is what I, the reason why I think it works, is that we would never use the voiceover in an expository way. You know, you would never use it to say, here's what you're about to see. Or, or this is what you just saw means, you know, um, that we would always use it to add another layer, to, to be Salim reflecting on his life or thinking about, thinking about themes of the story and so on. Use it in an almost poetic way, you know, as a kind of another layer of meaning that you would lay on the story. And, and then that's why I think it does work in the end, that it never says, and now this happened, you know, <laughs> and, then, and then you see it happen. You know? um, um, it was a very late decision. It was a late decision to have the voice. It was after we'd done the first cut. You know, uh, um, the late decision to have a voiceover at all. Um, you know, then I settled down to write it, and an even later decision for me to do the voiceover, uh, because my view had been, you know, get an actor, you know, and, and and I think Deepa actually did try to do it with a couple of 
actors. You know, and she came back to me and she said, I just don't like it and I think you should do it. And I gained, you know, I had to have my arm twisted, but Deepa is very good at arm twisting. <laughs> are, are you a movie fan? Yeah, yeah I think anyone who knows me at all knows that I've been a movie addict all my life. So in that sense, it doesn't feel like a strange world to me. Mm -hmm. you know, it feels, I mean, I also, you know, I grew up in, in a city which is obsessed by cinema. Uh, and where there's a cinema, I mean, where the, the movies are on every street corner. I mean, if you just look at the amount of coverage there is in the Indian press, of, uh, or the, the Bombay press of, of, of Bombay movies, I mean, it's just extraordinary. I mean, it's, you know, it makes, makes Hollywood look like a town that's not interested in the movies. <laughs> so, you mentioned that you had, uh, in the press materials, that you had creative control, or the, that the filmmakers had creative the three control, which did, is yes. very unusual, mm -hmm. at least in this town, to give filmmakers creative control, and it, yeah. because the argument is always that well, the producers will take it over and do the responsible yeah. thing. Well, it's because How we avoided. Well, that? we just avoided the big studios. I mean, that's a, the, that was a decision we made right away. You know, was that, uh, you know, we could probably have got the money much more easily, and we could probably have got much more money, which we actually did need. You know, um, we could have really done with a few million extra dollars you know, because the shoot was brutal. I mean, we had. You know, 65 locations in 70 shooting days, um, and just nightmare, and, and very, very long shooting days, uh, which required everybody to be very, um, you know, very giving, not people not to be like towing the union line and saying, you know, down tools now. People were just shot till the day's work was done, and everybody, everybody approached it in that spirit, which, without which we couldn't have done it. So we could really have done with a bit more money, you know. Um, I mean, not for us, although that would have been nice. <laughs> but, uh, but we decided right at the beginning that we were not going to go that route for exactly the reasons that you say, for reasons of creative control. That, you know, we wanted to have final cut. You know, uh, we, we wanted to not have casting decisions for, forced upon us. You know, uh, we, wanted not, we wanted to be able to, f to have the script to be what we wanted the script to be, rather than somebody else dictating that there should be another rewrite or new writers brought in or, you know, everything that can happen. A new narrator. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All that, you know. Uh, uh, and so we knew it would be very much harder to make the film because this also was at the time of the, the aftermath of the financial crash and so on, you know, when, when money for independent films was really very hard to get. Um, so we knew it would make it much harder to make the film. And I think the thing that actually helped us crucially was the fact that Deepa and David are, are Canadian-based. Uh, because Canada still has money that it makes available for independent cinema, you know. And I think uh, it ended up with a very sizable percentage of the budget, which, I mean, David Hamilton will tell you more exactly, but it's somewhere around, in my memory, somewhere around 40% of the budget, you know, uh, came from Canadian sources, from, you know, Film Board of Canada, you know, all these different Telefilm Canada, all these different bodies that, that, that are there, you know. And they all, I have to say, really gave us the maximum support that they were able to give us. You know, uh, partly because she is such a beloved figure in Canada. You know, people want to want to help her make her work as she as she wants to make it. So, you know, and I think in many ways, Deepa and I have been saying every time we've had these opportunities to talk to the media that that everybody says this is Deepa's film and my film, but actually, in a very very important sense, this is David Hamilton's film because he. If he, if he had not spent whatever it was, two and a half years, putting this together, there would be no movie. You know? and, and then, to be able to bring this film home when, when, the, when, the, when the budget was so tight, when the requirement on everybody was so intense, it is to get it done, to be able to bring it home on time and on budget, I mean, that was happening. Who knew that that could even be done? You know? um, as I say, it required a very tolerant crew and a very tolerant cast. Know, which which we were very lucky to have. And they seemed to share your vision. Everybody wanted vision. to be, you know, people really felt that they wanted this to happen, you know, the, and they wanted to be part of it. You know, the cast were all very, I mean, ridiculously proud to be playing parts in Midnight's Children, you know, which were, in many, for many of them, was a book they'd read when they were young and it had, you know, it meant something to them. And for them to be able to embody the character that they'd read, you know, was they, they felt very proud to be in it. And, and as a result, I mean, I think you see it on the screen. Everybody is so giving everything they've got, you know. And, and, and as I said last night at Arclight when we had the screening, that we said to everybody, you know, there are no stars in this film. 
although many of these actors in India are quite considerable stars, you know. Shabana Azmi, Rahul Bose, these people, they're, you know, they're very, very well-known people. Um, uh, Shriya Saran, who plays Parvati the Witch, and Siddharth, who plays, uh, who plays Shiva, uh, they're not Bombay actors, they're South Indian actors, but, but they're very, very big in South Indian cinema, Tamil cinema, Telugu cinema. So many of these people have the experience of being movie stars, you know, and, be, and, be, and being treated as movie stars.